Okay. All right. Let's see. Uh, I want to start seminar actually with a painting here that it might not be apparent is, is uh, related to the topic at hand, uh, but I'm going to make a connection here. And so if you don't know, this is Salvador Dali's painting, The Persistence of Memory, La Persistencia de la Memoria. It's probably his most famous painting. And um, it's a very striking painting. And there are a couple of things that I want to mention about this painting here. The first is obviously the topic of time. Uh, we have these melting clocks here. One of them is not melting. And the title is The Persistence of Memory, which is tied into this idea of time. And um, um, time is something that um, I've been thinking a lot about lately, in particular with COVID, my kind of my relationship with time has changed. It's a little hard to explain, but I feel like uh, time is, I don't know, it's, it's becoming a little bit more flexible or something. And I, I feel a little bit more flexible with things like um, deadlines that I give my students and and I don't know I just feel that time seems to be shifting a little bit and and our perception of time seems to be shifting slightly and so I've been thinking a lot about it and coming back into the classroom with a full schedule with you know class starts at 3 10 and we end at 5 25 and all kind of these these hard deadlines and, and punctuality and and we kind of didn't have that as much during covid and it, it's kind of been a little bit jarring to be thrown back into a world with kind of real kind of strict punctuality with these um start times and end times and it, it's gotten me uh, thinking about something that uh, has been um, interesting to me since uh, graduate school is the idea of liminality, temporal liminality, this idea of thresholds, this, this um, when it comes to time, right, it would be the ending of one season and the beginning of another season. And I think it's kind of appropriate at this time of the year to talk about this idea of liminality and transitioning from one time to another time, in particular because yesterday was the first day of, of fall, but also because um, it's Friday at a four at four o'clock in the afternoon. And at first I thought, what a bummer of a time. I don't want to have to come to campus on Friday. This is the first semester where I've ever come to campus on Friday regularly. And it was, I was kind of bummed out about Friday at four and maybe the students won't show up and maybe no one's going to be attending. And then I really started to think about it. And I, and I started to think about um, this idea of liminality. And I said, good grief, this is the absolute perfect time for a meeting. Why? Because it's four o'clock. It's the last hour of the work week. And we're closing the work week. And with the end of this meeting, we'll, the work week will be over and the weekend will be here. And so I call this hour the liminal hour. In fact, I call this entire series, hopefully it's going to be Friday at four every single uh, time, every single month this semester. I'm, I'm calling this um, seminar series the liminal hour. Uh, not just because of four o'clock and here we are and the weekend is here and we're transitioning into kind of this quote unquote free time, but also this idea that, um, that we see with psychedelics and we'll get into this a little bit more here. And I'm gonna be using lots of different terms. I'll be, a lot of these are interchangeable and, and it's kind of just convenience which one I use at, at which time, but psychedelics and sacred plants and entheogens and, and sacred medicine and, and, and all of these things so they're to a certain extent uh, it, interchangeable. And so um, please forgive me if, if I use a word that you might not like. I, I often will use it with, spe with something specific in mind. And so right now I'm talking about psych psychedelics and we'll get into this specific word and how it's uh, kind of how it was coined, where it came from, what it means, what it means to us as students of these plants. But then also this idea of psychedelics is um, something we've been seeing since the 60s is this idea that, that that these plants have a special power to kind of break down borders they dissolve barriers and this idea of liminality is is a space in between right it's not inside it's not outside it's the threshold if you will of a house it's where you're going you're transitioning from outside to inside and so it's kind of this in between space and psychedelics, again, have this kind of uncanny power to break down kind of the, the cultural structures that we've been living with since we're, we were born 
and to dissolve these boundaries, to, to dissolve the boundary between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind, to dissolve the boundary between, um, you know, maybe this dimension and some other dimension, whatever that dimension is, or the boundary between the self and the other, or the individual and the group, or sickness and health, or the physical and the mental, or the psychic, or the spiritual, or whatever. And so these, these plants are extremely powerful and and that's one of kind of the the recurring reports is that these plants have a way of breaking down kind of the structures that we've built up around ourselves and that we've been supporting ourselves on uh for most of our lives and in doing so we're kind of left with having to kind of find new structures or kind of have a the, kind of the neural pathways kind of or set themselves again. And so this idea of time, uh, especially on Thursday or on a Friday at four o'clock, this idea of psychedelics, this painting of Salvador Dali, and I don't think there's any painter that is, in my opinion, more psychedelic than this. I mean, even the more modern, purely psychedelic painters that, that do nothing but paint, you know, DMT uh, experiences, I don't find as psychedelic as this uh, painting by Dali. And it has to go to, I think, the idea of what he's doing with um, surrealism. And so surrealism, right, famously Salvador Dali is probably one of the foremost proponents and examples of this idea of this artistic movement, this idea of surrealism. And if you look into the definition of surrealism, it really kind of reveals that there's more in common with these special plants and this artistic movement than maybe was first, you know, was first imagined. And so the definition here from the Oxford Dictionary of Art and Artists says surrealism, the project of surrealism is to resolve the previously contradictory conditions of dream and reality into one super reality, to bring the those things, those dream kind of expressions and experiences into contact with our everyday waking reality and to create something new. And it really seems like that could be the definition of one of the things that a, psych a psychedelic does, is to put your subconscious into contact with your consciousness and kind of in into, into a kind of a, a greater whole, if you will. And so I kind of wanted to use that uh, to introduce a few of the ideas that we're going to be talking about in this, uh, in this seminar. Again, if at any point you have any comments, please just let me know. I'll be trying to check uh, the chat uh, for any comments, and then I'll be looking around the room as well uh, to get any comments from you guys in the room. Um, and so with that said, um, let's kind of get into the topic at hand today. And so the topic today is... Um, especially peyote, but also a few other cacti that contain uh, the same um, chemicals, the same substances as peyote. And so we're going to be looking at mainly peyote, but also a couple of others, Peruvian torch, Bolivian uh, torch, um, San Pedro as well. Uh, but we're going to focus on um, peyote. So let's get into a little bit of, uh, about peyote here. I think it's, it's probably extremely appropriate to start this type of seminar, the first, the, the inaugural um, uh, meeting, talking about peyote, because peyote has a very special place in the study of psychedelics and in the study of sacred plants and in, in kind of the history of sacred plants and how they're used uh, around the world. And, um, and I'm gonna be tying that in in just a second here. And so um, along with LSD and psilocybin mushrooms and LSA and DMT, uh, peyote is considered kind of one of the classic psychedelics. And it has the distinction of being the first um, a psychedelic to be isolated and synthesized by Western science. Uh, it also is the origin of the term psychedelic itself. And we'll be talking a little bit about that as well. Um, on more than one occasion, peyote has been tied to kind of these great cultural conflicts and changes. Uh, and peyote has had a faster diffusion through North American Indian tribes than probably any other cultural artifact on the continent. And it's a pretty amazing thing. And we'll talk a little bit about that history as well. Its adoption and incorporation by the Plains tribes as a sacrament in the Native American church has been a point of contention with the government. And it has played a key role in US legal history and the freedom of religion. And so peyote is kind of, is, is, is one of the more important 
um, sacred plants that we'll be talking about this year. And I think a very appropriate plant to start off the semester with. Uh, let's talk about its biological description here. And so, um, again, I am not a biologist. I'm not a chemist. I'm, um, I study language and literature. And so if at any point I'm mistaken, um, just, you know, raise your hand and let me know and we'll, we'll correct the record and move forward. Um, and if you have anything else to say, uh, please, at any point, let me know. And so, um, first and foremost, the scientific name of peyote is Lophophora williamsi. And it is a small bluish green spineless cactus with pink or white flowers. It grows low to the ground. Um, it grows sometimes uh, by itself, sometimes in small clumps, uh, usually under shrubs. The native or indigenous habitat is of peyote is um, mainly the Rio Grande Valley in northern Mexico and southwestern Texas, below elevations of 5,000 feet. It grows mainly on or near limestone hills. Uh, it is extremely slow growing in the, growing in the wild, uh, but when it's cultivated, specimens can grow from, from seed to maturity in about three years. And so it, it's, uh, it, it grows much faster in, uh, as a cultivated specimen. Uh, as far as chemical composition, the active molecule of peyote is called mescaline. Uh, let's see if I can get this right. It's also uh, more formally known as 3,4,5-trimethoxyphenylethamine. Phenylethylamine. Phenyl uh, man, I am not a scientist, guys, so sorry if I'm butchering that. Uh, and it belongs to the substituted phenylethyl... Phenyl oh, Dios mío. Phenylethylamine class, um, which is interesting because it's quite different than LSD, uh, magic mushrooms, and DMT, and so it belongs to an entirely different family of of um, of chemicals. The average dose of mescaline is is right in the, about the 200 to 400 milligrams range, and an average three-inch dried peyote button contains about four to five percent mescaline, or 25 milligrams of mescaline, which puts an average dose at between eight to 16 buttons. Now, obviously, this will vary depending on the strength of the specimens and some other um, conditions as well. Um, let's get into the. Oh, sorry. So that's, uh, that's the, um, uh, the kind of the indigenous habitat, if you will, um, focusing on the Rio Grande Valley, but also pushing down a little bit into San Luis Potosi in Mexico, um, Zacatecas, I think as well. And so it kind of, um, the region where it grows, is, it pushes down into kind of the heart of Mexico there. Um, let's look at the earliest historical evidence of the use of peyote. And unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of archaeological evidence for the use of peyote. Um, what we do have is a very interesting, though. The oldest site where the cactus has been found is called Shumla Cave in the lower Picos region of southwestern Texas. It was excavated in the 1930s, and they found uh, several different, uh, different samples of what is essentially peyote uh, material. Um, from what I can tell, and I haven't looked into this too far, but from what I can tell, they're, they're kind of, um, they weren't entire buttons themselves, but um, kind of um, uh, uh, parts of peyote that were mixed with some other plants to form these peyote-shaped discs, uh, which is quite interesting. And um, radiocarbon analysis of these specimens puts the date uh, at around 3,700 BC. And so this is a plant that has most likely been known to humans and consumed by humans, probably in some kind of ritual um, or religious context for almost 6,000 years. And so that's pretty remarkable. It's not the the um, the longest standing used psychedelic on the planet, but uh, it's extremely well established. Uh, and so that's very interesting. Um, moving forward a little bit, that's, as, that's about it for kind of the, the ancient archeological evidence. Uh, moving forward a little bit here, we get to kind of the Aztec Mexica um, period in time and um, the word peyote itself is a Hispanicization of the Nahuatl word peyotl, 
uh, which means caterpillar cocoon. I don't think we have any pictures. Uh, you can kind of see it there. In this one here, you can kind of see the, the wispy tufts of hairs here, as well as here. And so this is a spineless cactus, but those little hairs there, which are sometimes removed before consuming, um, I imagine lend themselves to the Nahuatl name uh, caterpillar cocoon, because it looks like some kind of um, cocoon material there. So the Aztecs definitely knew of the plant. They used it for a variety of purposes, both medicinal and magical um, religious. The Aztecs claimed that the Chichimecs were the ones that discovered it. Now the name Chichimec was used to refer to the uncultured and less and less civilized semi-nomadic tribes from the north. Um, they were in fact the very forefathers of the Aztecs themselves, but at some point when the Aztecs started mixing with the Toltecs, they probably started to look down at what they viewed were less civilized or less cultured uh, people from the northern part of, Me of um, Mesoamerica. And so um, I don't know to what extent that was a stigma that, that maybe dissuaded uh, use by the Aztecs of peyote. As I said, they definitely were using it, but they seem to have preferred several other plants that they would use for almost the exact same purposes, in particular the seeds of the morning glory um, or, or the magic mushrooms. And so... Um, at any rate, the Mexica credited the Chichimecas with um, discovering the plant. Um, so, um, is there a question there? No. Yeah, me too. All right. Um, so they were using this plant for all kinds of different things, both as an external medicine, right, to apply to wounds outside of the body, but also as an internal medicine to consume in case of a toothache or headache or different types of conditions. Um, but it was also used to induce visions for purposes of supernatural revelation. And the Mexica and the Chichimecas were not the only ones to be using this plant. I mean, the list of tribes that were regularly using this plant is is a quite extensive, the Zacateco, the Opata, the Pima, the Acache, the Lagunero, the Cascan, the Queres, the Tarasco, the Tamaulipeco, the Isleta, the Taos, the Coahuilteco, uh, the Comanche, the Kiowa Apache, the Lipan Apache, the Cora, the Huicho, the Tarahumara, the Humana, Humano, and several others as well. And so this, is an ex this was an extremely, and continues to be to this day, an extremely important uh, plant for a number of different um, traditions uh, covering Mexico, as well as into um, the American Southwest and what is today New Mexico, um, uh, et cetera. Um, all right, so here, this is a, an image of the Chichimecas. I believe this is from um, Bernardino de Sahagún's um, the Florentine Codex here. They're shown as kind of um, maybe semi-nomadic hunters, right? Their, their, their clothing is not as refined as what you might see on a Mexica. Um, and, and probably their clothing's made out of maguey, something a little bit more fibrous, not as soft and smooth as a cotton clothing uh, that was more commonly worn by a Mexica no nobility. And so there's, again, this idea that the Mexica represented maybe people that were, were maybe less civilized, less cultured, or something like that, right? Uh, whether or not that's true, right, is is uh, is, is, is a side, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter as much, right? That's kind of how they were viewed a lot of times. Um, all right, uh, go ahead, please. Okay, what question in here? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, to tell you the truth, I don't. So the question was, if you apply this to wounds outside of the body, right, um, it, it would not have any type of psychological effect. I, I don't know. To my, to my knowledge, mescaline is not transdermal. I don't, 
I don't think it can go through the skin. There are others that, that can, hyoscyamine or atropine, or, um, um, but I don't think that mescaline can be absorbed through the skin. Maybe if someone has better knowledge of that, uh, that'd be great to hear. Um, but uh, there might be other alkaloids. I mean, these plants are full of lots of different alkaloids. And a lot of times these alkaloids kind of work in conjunction with each other. And it's not always just the main psychoactive component that is used as a medicine. There are other adjuncts in the plant that can also um, uh, assist in healing and things like that. But it's a very good question. I would have to um, look into it a little bit more to, to, get, to get back to you though. Yeah. So um, here uh, it's worth mentioning before we get into um, kind of um, before we get into kind of the use of peyote in New Spain under kind of a, a more colonial system, it's important I think to point out some modern day usage by several of the tribes in Mexico, and they've kind of become um, well known as as um, being um, supporters of this plant medicine, uh, the, the huichol and the tarahumara in particular, uh, and, and the cora in particular of Western Mexico have a long history of uh, use of using this plant. Um, here we can see um, quite a bit of artwork um, that's being done. It's uh, chakira is the type of artwork. It's very small beads that are used to decorate certain items. And one of the most common um, symbols that is uh, represented in their art is the peyote plant itself. And so you can kind of see in several of these, you can see a peyote here with its root system here. And this one also has its root system here. These are peyotes, these are all peyotes. Sorry. Um, no, those are th those are artistic representations, and so they're not the cactus itself. They are merely representations of the cactus and kind of um, paying respect to the cactus as an important part of uh, the Huichol and Tarahumara uh, worldview. Uh, it's very closely associated with the deer, um, very closely associated with, uh, with corn as well. They're often seen as being three kind of manifestations of the same life-giving spirit. And so um, the hunt and agriculture and peyote are, are all interconnected, especially for the Huichol um, people. And they perform a, an annual um, pilgrimage to uh, what they consider to be their homeland of Wirikuta, uh, which is in San Luis Potosi. And on this pilgrimage, they will regularly collect peyote buttons and uh, consume peyote buttons, as well as bring peyote back to uh, the tribe for uh, everyone else to consume. And there's a whole series of kind of important religious rites and practices tied into this pilgrimage, things like confession of sins and sexual immorality, things like um, sometimes blindfolding, this idea of sight, not having sight, and then receiving sight, being able to perceive things is very important as well. Um, and so um, this is a very important part of uh, the Weechol religious practice. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the three, the three ideas, these kind of the, these three concepts that uh, often overlap and are seen as kind of um, as kind of one in in the same, different manifestations of the same life giving spirit would be peyote, the the medicine plant, the the sacred plant as a medicine, and then corn, right, which represents agriculture, um, it's the the sustenance of life uh, through agriculture, and then deer, that's to say hunting meat. And so these uh, uh, often deer is called brother deer and things like that. And so they're kind of seen as different manifestations of the same life-giving spirit and seen as almost as, as like siblings, if you as spiritual siblings. Um, and so um, uh, corn and the, har the harvesting and, uh, of corn and, and, the, and hunting for meat and particular deer and uh, the search, the pilgrimage and the search for um, peyote are all kind of different manifestations of the same search for health and life. And once, for example, once the, the, the harvest has been done, all of the corn has been brought in from the fields, that's when the pilgrimage begins. And the pilgrimage can take place from the end of harvest until the beginning of the planting season. 
And so it's kind of like, again, you know, you spend, you know, several months of the year planting and tending to your corn and harvesting your corn, and then you go on pilgrimage and you're, you're seeking for a different type of, of life sustaining force uh, that, that is usually received and, and, um, and consumed through the peyote. Um, here, uh, so here we have, um, these are both Weechul, members of the Weechul tribe here, this lady here and this gentleman here. And I think one of the things that, that, uh, that stands out to me is, uh, is the dress, right? Extremely colorful, very floral, usually um, not just peyote uh, is, is used as a symbol uh, in, in their artwork, but also deer. You can see it on the bottom of his pants here, he has deer on the bottom of his pants. And so a lot of these ideas, these these, the corn and the, and the deer and the peyote, but also flowers, they're very kind of, they're interrelated, if you will. And um, accessing these different things, whether it's eating corn or eating meat or consuming peyote is again, a different way to access this life-sustaining power. Yeah, comment in online. I like the mask with the peyote in the middle between the eyes, kind of like opening the third eye. Yeah, I really like that too. It's, uh, it's amazing. Um, it, they're, they're incredible artisans, incredible artists. And I love what they do with their symbols. We have a, a several questions in here. Um, yeah, go ahead, comments. Your question, though, is not uh, have any effect to the body. The, uh, it helps with wound fractures, it also helps with pain fractures. Um, I was just doing a little bit of research on it, uh, looking at the Great. I don't know if you guys heard that online, but uh, the comment was that there is no transdermal act activity with uh, mescaline. So there must be something else going on, why it's used for breaks or abrasions or whatever. Thank you very much. Um, another comment here online, it says the peyote art must be some sort of illusions you see while on the trip. Um, yeah, uh, I think to a certain extent you're right, right? Uh, I, I think that um, there are different cultures where different substances have obviously influenced the aesthetic, right? Think of India, for example, and the incredible aesthetic there. And India is, is obviously has a lot of cannabis consumption and in the kind of intricate lattice work and the architecture and the artwork, um, it kind of lends itself to uh, certain, uh, certain um, substances. And so I think you're probably right. Not only does it kind of indirectly affect the aesthetic of the art, but there's also another part of it where the creation of the artwork is kind of like what we would consider a, a modern day trip report. And so I'm kind of hesitant to share this because these are special things and, and sharing a, a kind of a spiritual special experience is something very personal. Um, but one of the practices of the Weichel people is to make these, I don't know if you can see it up here, is to make these um, string, um, these string, I don't know, string art, if you will. And so that's all um, pieces of string that have been formed into different shapes to represent different things. And obviously you can see the peyote going around here, but we've got the sun in the middle and all kinds of other different types of, of, uh, of images here, a drum down here at the bottom, candles, there's corn right here. Um, I think we've got a, there's a deer right up here. Um, lots of different flowers and people and kind of different amorphous figures. This looks like it's a, a humanoid figure with antlers on it. And so different animals and spiders and different types of things. And this is uh, very common to find in the state of Jalisco. In fact, I bought this in the state of Jalisco and on the back has a, it has a description of, uh, of what is represented here. And so um, I'm not gonna get into it. Uh, it's in Spanish, um, but it's a, it's a description of all the different symbols and all the different representations. And so I don't know if this necessarily was from one specific experience or kind of a generalized experience, um, 
but um, that's one of their practices that I find extremely fascinating. And it also happens to be some of my favorite artwork. Um, so it says here, Mary is kind of, okay. Mary's company, we have someone in the community space who people are from Nayarit and Wicho. They are saying that they are taught that they are keepers of the dream world and that their dreams are significant to their upbringing and their life's purpose. That's fantastic. Yeah, um, I, I think that um, when you get a community that has such an such a long-standing tradition of use of special plants, then, then they really start to develop some interesting perspectives. And um, that's fascinating. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it is, but I would, be, I would be really surprised if the Maya were using any peyote. I mean, it has a very limited indigenous kind of um, a habitat. And obviously there was trade and, and, and these were valuable commodities and they were traded regularly. We'll see that trade became an important aspect of the transmission of this knowledge and practice into the American, uh, what would become the American Plains. Uh, but I, I don't think that it got down there that far. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, the, the Maya were interested in a lot of other things that they really liked the magic mushrooms. They really liked the um, morning, the morning glories, and they liked the tobacco, and they liked a, a couple of other things as well. And and I I don't think that that peyote made it that far. At least I haven't seen any any comments or any records of that. Um, I was just interested in natives in Mexico and South Texas. Uh, it's from <laughs> Desert and South, the South Texas. Oh, Chihuahua. There you go. The Chihuahua Desert. Mm -hmm. And on either side of the little Noah Rio Grande River sits the grand southwest of the Mexican state of San Luis. Potosi. Potosi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I don't think it made it that far down there. Um, I could be wrong, but yeah. All right, um, let's kind of, um, actually, let's see. I want to, before we get to Quanta Parker, um, let, me, let me say a few words about New Spain and, um, and the contact between the Spanish and the indigenous peoples of Mesoamerica and the reaction of the Spanish vis-a-vis uh, -vis all these powerful plants. And so, um, so Hernan Cortez arrives in Mexico in 1519. Um, Tenochtitlan is conquered in 1521, and almost immediately uh, the, the Spanish start to see, uh, kind of be exposed to the use of some of these powerful substances. And um, peyote is one of those uh, plants that, um, a Spain, that the Spanish were exposed to, and obviously um, there was a lot of religious fervor to convert the indigenous people to Christianity, and a lot of these practices of consuming these different plants in order to have visions, in order to access information that is not normally available, in order to divine the future, in order to find lost or stolen objects, in order to uh, discover the source of, uh, of sickness and to heal. Uh, the, all of these kind of uses of these special plants were seen as blasphemous at best. And so um, the Spanish were, were highly motiv motivated to, to, to stop this practice. And, um, and what's interesting is, is that by 1575, um, the indigenous people of Mesoamerica were no longer under the purview of the Inquisition. That's to say the Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition, famous for maintaining the purity of the Catholic faith, um, no longer had dominion over the Indians in order to bring them in on charges. There were some extreme cases early on in the colonial times where um, several bishops were kind of abusing their power and doing certain things that people didn't like and agree with. And so um, because of that, they, they, they removed the ability of the Inquisition to inquire into uh, indigenous matters. Okay, and that was by 1575. But what we see by 1620, right, so barely 50 years later, is the Inquisition coming out and making the use of peyote illegal. And what that says to me is that, that it wasn't only the indigenous people of this area that were using this plant. 
If, if it were only the indigenous people, why would they make it illegal? Because the Inquisition no longer had purview over the indigenous people. And so what it seems to me to be saying is that there was a, a, a large or, or um, there was a group of, of probably mestizo um, individuals that had, had learned of this practice, had incorporated it into their worldview and into their religious um, uh, life and we're using this as a tool in order to accomplish whatever it was that they wanted to accomplish, whether it was healing, whether it was finding a lost object or stolen object, whether it was predicting the future or whatever. And so um, it seems to me that that the use of this plant as a tool started to spread out, right? Not just being restricted to indigenous communities, but starting to to kind of um, to, to, to seep into the larger community. And because of that, the Inquisition had to react and, and make it illegal in 1620. Let me check the chat here, okay. Um, let's move on. Um, I, I don't have a whole lot more to say about the Inquisition in New Spain and, and, and the colonial times. Um, there are some other, I think, more interesting plants that, that are more clearly discussed and, and, and more clearly problematic when it comes to the difference between Spanish and the indigenous peoples, in particular, Teo uh, the flesh of the gods or magic mushrooms. And so I think we'll save some of that discussion for uh, a later date, and we'll move on to something that I find to be very interesting here, which is the diffusion of peyote from Mexico into what is today the United States. And that uh, this person plays a very important role in that. This is Quana Parker. And Quana Parker was born in Oklahoma to an Indian chief and a white woman that was captured as a nine-year-old and assimilated into the Comanche tribe. He was, as I said, he was a Comanche. While on a raid in Mexican territory in the 1880s, he was injured and nursed back to health with the help of peyote. And during his convalescence, he had a vision that the peyote cactus would be able to heal Native Americans in a time of great strife and cultural upheaval. This is the 1880s. This is in the, it, this is in the years after the Indian Wars, where the U.S. government is focusing on the indigenous people of this continent, pushing them off their lands, waging war against them, and, 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 and that caused all kinds of chaos in the indigenous cultures and communities. We see things like the loss of the Sundance. Uh, for the Plains uh, uh, Indians, um, there wasn't much emphasis placed on these, uh, what I'm calling, what I'm going to call psychedelic plants. That's to say they had tobacco, they had a few other plants that they would regularly use, sage, etc. But as far as these kind of real intense, classic psychedelics, the Plains Indians weren't doing that very much. They would achieve altered states of consciousness, but not through the consumption of plants. It was almost always through ordeal. And so the sun dance is where, you know, an individual in the center of the, of the village, they would have a pole and they would have ropes and they would attach, they would put spikes through the fleshy parts of the chest and they would suspend themselves from their chest on these hooks and they would lean back and they would look up at the sun um, uh, uh, literally blinding themselves right usually I think it was one individual of the tribe would literally blind himself looking at the sun so that the, the rest of the tribe would be able to regain their vision during the rest of the year. And so it was a physical sacrifice in order to increase the metaphoric vision of, of the rest of the group. And so um, they were much more interested in these ordeal um, challenges, if you will, um, dancing, drumming, um, pain. Um, and, they, and they didn't really get into these strong psychedelics. Well, all that changed with Quanta Parker, okay? Um, the American government made the sun dance illegal and after the Sundance was illegal, uh, a lot of these tribes started to invent something new and, and they turned to the ghost dance, which is kind of this, this millenarian kind of uh, this trance um, experience where, where they were looking forward to the day when the buffalo would come back and the white man would be pushed off of their land. And, and if you're the US government, that doesn't sound good. And so the US government didn't like that. And so they banned the ghost dance as well. And so here we have a people that, that has lost the, the ritual, the religious ritual that had kept them together as a group. 
And, and what, they, what they saw in this vision or what Quanta Parker saw in this vision was that this plant, that this special medicine had the power to, to fill the void of the ghost dance, of the sun dance, and to create some kind of cohesive culture amongst the Plains Indians. <clears throat> and so, um, Uh, as the missions and reservations were being established to try to assimilate Native Indians to American culture, many Indians turned to peyote as an alternative way to commune with the spirit world and preserve and promote a certain pan-tribalism, if you will. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the reasons why today in the Native American church, these ceremonies are held in the teepee. That's to say, it's a private place away from the prying eyes of the US government and the Indian agents that might see them doing something that the US government didn't want them to do. And so um, another person here is, is important in this story. Uh, that's James Mooney. And James Mooney was an American ethnographer working with the Smithsonian Institute. And he had an incredible knowledge of language and culture. Um, and, and he kind of was helping uh, and at a moment where the US government was trying to force Indians to become less Indian, he was working the other way. He was trying to, to gather information, uh, cultural information, linguistic information. He was trying to, to help the indigenous people of the plains to retain their cohesion and their cohesiveness. And, and he um, did a lot of good work in that regard. He wrote, wrote an incredible book on the ghost dance uh, I think that was published in the 1890s. And, and he worked with the Kiowa people in Oklahoma. And while he was in Oklahoma, he came across the peyote plant and recognized its potential for rehab rehabilitating these shattered communities. He wrote several reports as uh, being a member of the Smithsonian Institute. He would um, make formal reports excuse me, to Congress, and he, he reported, so numerous and important are its medical applications and so exhilarating and glorious its effect that it's regarded as the vegetable incarnation of a deity and the ceremonial eating of the plant has become the great religious rite of all of the tribes of the Southern Plains. The Indians regard the peyote as a panacea in medicine for fever, for chest pains. He saw someone that he thought was suffering from tuberculosis be revived just by peyote. And so peyote was used often not even to, to attain these altered states of consciousness, but in smaller doses as, as a powerful medicine that has, that has the power to heal the body, right? Not just the mind or the culture or the group, but, but the actual body itself. And Mooney encouraged the Kiowa and other tribes to organize into the Native American church and uh, thinking that this type of legitimacy would, would provide a little bit of protection for the practice of eating peyote. And uh, the idea here being that if it's part of an official recognized religion, then they can rely on the freedom of religion and they can consume this as more of a sacrament and less of a medicine. And that would prevent the U.S. government from outlawing it and banning it. Quanah, Quanah Parker called Mooney the only white man that understood their religion. Mooney brought a, bought a big, a big sack of peyote from Quanah Parker and brought it back to Washington. And this is essentially going to be the beginning of the Western scientific kind of empirical investigation into these substances. Um, there were two gentlemen called... Um, there were two gentlemen called uh, Prentice and Morgan, and they worked at uh, Columbian University in Washington, DC. And they were the first ones to actually uh, begin um, trials of peyote with volunteer subjects uh, under medical supervision. They would start with three peyote buttons and add more if they wanted to. And this is kind of the very, the very beginning of, again, this Western study of the, the, the plant with kind of a detailed as description of, of, uh, of the experience itself. And so we're getting kind of the Western counterpoint to, to this right here, right? If this is seen as kind of like a visual trip report, everything that a subject might have experienced, then what we have coming out of, 
uh, Columbian University in Washington, DC is again, kind of the Western literary counterpoint. This is what one subject reported after the trial. Um, there followed a train of delightful visions such as no human being ever enjoyed under normal conditions, an ever, uh, an ever changing panorama of infinite beauty and grandeur of infinite variety of color and form hurried before me, my pleasure so far past the more ordinary realms of delight as to bring me to that high ecstatic state in which our exclamations of pleasure become involuntary. How's that? Um, but not every subject reported this kind of ecstatic reaction. And this introduces one of the most interesting things about these, um, these uh, substances is, is it's not real common in pharmacy to have a substance that doesn't have consistent results in the patient. And so what we see is some kind of subjectivity. That's to say the condition and state of the patient, of the consumer, plays a role in the reaction and how the individual is going to experience the, the medicine. Um, let me go back here. I've got some comments here. They would dance and get in a trance, definitely. Mary says, I think it's very important to clarify that the criminalizing of na native spirituality, medicine, language, songs, dance, even cutting the hair and implementing boarding in residential schools all happen to native peoples across the continent, often stigmatizing and adding to the erasure, genocide, and disconnection of so many native clans, not just the natives. I agree 100%. Yes, Mary, thank you very much. Um, all right. And so um, one subject, for example, uh, reported uh, reported that uh, he had a marked feeling of distrust and resentment toward those that were making the experiment with him. He firmly believed that they were laughing at his condition. <clears throat> he believed that they were intending to kill him. Later, he wrote that peyote had made him totally insane. And so today we have kind of the philosophical uh, structure and framework of set and setting, uh, but, but they didn't have that back then in the, in the end of the 19th century. And so they didn't really understand that what the individual brought to the experience gets amplified. And so if an individual is, is, is coming to the experience with, with um, uh, uncertainty or concern or things like that, or if they're in a new place that's different, then the chances of having one of these types of kind of paranoid reactions is greatly increased. And compare that to kind of the cultural framework that we see in the indigenous communities. We've got seven, you know, 5,000 years of experience with the plant. You know, kids, when they're little, when they're little ch children hear about the plant, they hear about the experience and they see their siblings go through it. They see their parents go through it. They see the healing and the cohesion that it brings. And it's almost always seen as a positive thing. Even if there's a challenging experience during one of these rites, it's still seen as kind of as, as a necessary, um, a necessary purge, if you will, a necessary kind of um, uh, path through the valley of the shadow of death. And so it's seen as something positive. And so that cultural structure and foundation allows the individuals to incorporate the experience, I think, more successfully into their life. And that's something that we, we don't see as much in the Western world. And that's something that when we did start to incorporate these substances into uh, American life, in the starting in the 1950s and the 60s and and you know it, it didn't take long for society to say we can't have this at all this is too much you know and within 20 years they're all illegal and so by 1970 all these substances were all illegal and most likely because we didn't have that cultural groundwork we didn't have that structure in order to 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 understand these different experiences and so again, this raises this very intri intriguing ideas of the effects of these plants on the individual and what we bring to the experience gets heightened. Um, Stanislav Grof said, he calls them non-specific amplifiers. And so he says, psychedelics are non-specific amplifiers. Whatever you bring to the table will get increased. If you're bringing a good time and happiness and comfort and, and, and a relaxed atmosphere or, or purposeful uh, intention to work on your spirit or relationships or to do kind of what I call deep work, right? Then, then you, the chances of you having a good experience are increased. 
And if you bring, you know, skepticism or concern or paranoia or worry, um, those, those things, those negative experiences will only be amplified. Um, and again, this presented a kind of a new problem to Western pharmacy. We hadn't really seen this. Remember, pe peyote was the first psychedelic that was, was I identified, isolated, and synthesized by Western science. And so it's entirely new. It's entirely new to the West. And in a lot of ways, the Western empirical mind wasn't ready and maybe still isn't ready to fully understand the power of, of these substances. Um, several other Western physicians, extremely renowned and, and um, uh, physicians at the top of their game, like Weir Mitchell or William James, experimented with this plant around 1896, and they had different results and kind of came to different conclusions, but it was almost always the self-assay. It was the doctor or the scientist consuming the plant himself, keeping a record of the experience to try to understand it better. Um, they very quickly identified the psychiatric potential uh, of this substance, and they hoped that maybe the plant would help to unlock some of the mysteries of, of psychotic conditions. And we would see this kind of this hope repeated with LSD and magic mushrooms in the 40s and 50s and 60s as well. Uh, by 1897, English physicians were experimenting with the plant, and so it shifted from uh, the United States to England. Uh, it also kind of came back to Canada. We'll get to that in just a minute. And in 1898, the German chemist Arthur Hefter fractioned out the alkaloids and sampled all of them and decided that mescaline was, in fact, the most active chemical uh, contained in the peyote plant, and he called it mescaline. It was first synthesized in 1919 by Ernst Spath. Um, and then we're gonna kind of jump forward. I don't have really have a lot of more information between about 1920 and the 1950s, but we need to jump to the 1950s and talk a little bit about Humphrey Os uh, Osmond. Let me look at the chat real quick. Very interesting amplifiers rather than Western medicine as a tranquilizer, that's to a certain extent. Yes, thank you, Priscilla. Um, so Humphrey Osmond was a British psychiatrist working in Canada in the 1950s, and he was experimenting with a lot of different things. He was looking at adrenaline. He was also looking at mescaline in treatments, and he started to communicate with Aldous Huxley. And if you don't know, Aldous Huxley is a British writer and poet who at the time was working in Hollywood writing scripts. He was a young man in his early 20s, I believe. And um, he inquired into uh, mescaline. And uh, Humphrey provided uh, some mescaline. I believe it was probably laboratory created mescaline. And he supervised, he, he, he was a trip sitter for Huxley uh, in, for one of probably the most famous experiments in uh, Western literature. That would become the basis for Hux, Huxley's famous work, The Doors of Perception. And we all know that The Doors of Perception uh, would go on to inspire Jim Morrison to give the name to his 1960, uh, 1960s band of The Doors. And so that's the origin of, um, of uh, The Doors. Um, Humphrey propo proposed the term psychedelic in 1956. I'm a student of language and words and etymologies. And um, I, um, we sometimes we forget that words haven't always been around and that words are created and words have an origin. Sometimes it's so far back in the past that uh, we can't re really find it, but sometimes it's not. And so this is one of those words that we can very clearly point to and say, this is the origin of the term psychedelic. And so psychedelic comes from 1956 when Humphrey proposed this idea. It comes from the Greek, psyche is mind, and delic is something like manifesting. And so psychedelic has the meaning of mind manifesting. It manifests what's on your mind. It puts the subconscious in contact with the conscious. Famously, he rhymed in a letter with Huxley, to fall in hell or soar angelic, you'll need a pinch of psychedelic. Mm -hmm. And so uh, pretty clever there. And so interesting that this word psychedelic here 
it has its origin in the study and experimentation and use of mescaline and therefore peyote. And so um, as Mike Jay in his new book says, um, peyote is therefore the world's first psychedelic. Um, it's not the first plant that has these powers, but if we're looking at just the term psychedelic and when it, when it came up, and, and how it was applied, then it's uh, impossible to, to, to separate out psychedelic from this plant. All right, um, let me look at the chat real quick. It says, for the curious about STS, uh, SDS on Sigma, some relevant on Wiki2, mescaline, good, chemical info, good. Um, I don't have a whole lot more to say about mescaline. I will say that since the 1950s, and in particular, since the, the, um, the discovery of LSD, mescaline has kind of taken a back seat. It, it's, it's kind of one of those obscure, um, at least in popular culture, right? It's kind of one of those obscure psychedelics that, that maybe you have to take a little too much and maybe you know it's a little bit difficult on um, the the GI uh, tract, and it's so much easier and, and faster to take a little tiny piece of paper in form of LSD um, and have something uh, have a similar reaction. And so um, it still it, it plays a very important role in the Native American Church as well as in multiple indigenous um, cultures in Mexico and in the United States. But in kind of in popular culture, it's kind of dropped up, dropped off, and and I think that um, I think that maybe that's fine. We kind of see kind of a resurgence a little bit. Um, I, before I go on, I saw a hand there. Athena, did you have something? Yeah, um, I wanted to add a couple things. Uh, I was reading an article on the website of the Native American Church, and it has a huge article about peyote and many different benefits, the risks behind it, and stuff like that. Um, but what I was reading is that in most cases, and what they've seen from peyote is that not only is it something that you can use in a religious sense as in going through your, your spiritual journey, but you can also use it um, in that same religious sense, you can use it to solve problems, to help with access to creativity, um, it also may be uh, where you, it opens up your mind to be more uh, environmental, environmentally con uh, conscious. Um, it also helps improve it with improving your learning. Um, it kind of opens the, the neurological ways to go ahead and absorb more information, not only in the spiritual sense, but also in an actual academic sense. That's great. Thank you very much. I will say uh, you mentioned creativity. And, um, I, you know, I look at some of these uh, Mesoamerican cultures and the sophistication of their societies and their artwork and their architecture and then th their uh, cosmogony and their religion and their the pantheon and just all of the incredible uh, developments that they had in, in inventing a writing system and and their calendars and their ability to track the stars and and just their 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 sophistication when it comes to society and I and and then I look at all of these magical, powerful plants that they're using, and it's very difficult for me to say that there's not a connection there. Because, um, you know, anecdotally, if you look at the Western world, and, and there's a lot of this, of using these plants to increase creativity, to kind of access different ways to think, to see new problems in a different way, and so um, I think creativity there is a very important part of this equation. And you also mentioned being uh, it, that it can make you more environmentally conscious. And I really like that too, as well. Going back to the idea that, that uh, they, these substances kind of break down barriers between people. One of the barriers that they help to kind of erode and, and remove is the barrier between us individuals and nature. And, 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 and often we're kind of, you know, we're in these boxes or whatever, we're, you know, we're outside, uh, we're, we're, we're not in contact with nature. And, and when, you, when you take some of these substances, they just, they, they put you face to face with nature. 
and and it's hard to not see yourself as one in part of the the entire thing and and kind of wanting to get out of this man-made structure and get into the natural world structure on the outside of that there's a bigger picture to not just your little space and it talks about going down the rabbit hole when you take something when you're you're comparing the blue pill to the red pill think about it as doing peyote or not doing peyote it's are you going to open in your mind consciously or are you just going to keep your life in this made split and it kind of like it brings a different perspective from a philosophical side of the appearance, the appearance to reality. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I'm just reading the comments here. Uh, it looks like in the future we're going to have to do something about mics because uh, they're having a little, a little bit of difficulty hearing the questions. Um, and I'm not going to be able to summarize all of that uh, for you. Uh, plus, I was kind of one eye here, yeah. one ear there, <laughs> and so sorry about that. We'll try to, uh, we'll try to get a little bit better audio for next time. And um, if the questions are short enough, then I'll repeat them for everyone online. Sorry about that, guys. Um, what I will say before we kind of move on, I don't have a whole lot more to say. That's Hefter. That's Humphrey Osmond. I, I wasn't uh, going through uh, these slides as well as I should have. Sorry about that. That's Aldous Huxley in his book, The Doors of Perception. You're welcome, Todd. All right, uh, I don't have much more to say about peyote. There are uh, several other topics that we could talk about. Uh, I, I wanna say a few words about San Pedro though. Um, I would refer you to, if you're interested in this idea of peyote, I would refer you to um, uh, mainly kind of the legal battle that the, that the Native American church has had to um, go through in securing their rights to, perform, to, to have this ritual in their religious beliefs. Um, there was a lot of pressure and some, supreme, some, some horrible Supreme Court decisions that made the use of the plant illegal. And, um, and so there, they had to pass a, a law that allowed the Native American church, I think this was under Clinton, I think in 1990, 1992 or something like that. Uh, he passed a law that, that, uh, that provided for the Native American church to continue to use this as a, uh, a sacred sacrament. And so, um, but, it, but again, it plays a very important and interesting role in, uh, in American US legal history, as well as um, in uh, the freedom of religion. Um, and, and that can be easily and quickly extended to things like um, um, the Brazilian Union da Vegetal, I think it's called. Uh, which is a church from Brazil that uses ayahuasca as a um, holy sacrament. And they currently uh, have, have had several, I think, have several legal battles with the United States and, and ensuring that they are able to use um, their holy sacrament. And so if you're interested in that, I would recommend you to, to pursue that uh, line of research. I, I do want to say a few things real quick about San Pedro. Um, I don't have a lot to say about it. Just a couple of quick uh, minutes here. And what I really, the main thing I want to say, these are, uh, these are a couple of San Pedros here that I got uh, as clippings from um, uh, the neighbor of my mother lives across the street and he has a couple of beautiful big San Pedros in front of his house. And I asked him for some clippings and I got them. Um, it probably been there for two years or so. When I got them, they were this big. You can see the edge. Of, of the extent of the cactus. So they're about that big right there. And they've grown all of that. And there's another one back here. And so what I would like to say is that um, the San Pedro is essentially the South American analog to the peyote plant. And so the peyote cactus. And so it contains the exact same molecule. It contains mescaline. And it's used in a, in a similar way for similar things 
for lots of different types of healing, both physical, mental, and spiritual, but also for shamanic work. That's to say for accessing knowledge and information that is usually outside of our grasp. That's to say finding lost or stolen objects, finding the source of sickness, or divining the future, or uh, accessing information that, again, that's outside of your grasp. And um, the thing that I find so incredible and, and somewhat repugnant about the laws of this, of this country is that peyote is 100% illegal for me to have, but I can go to Home Depot and I can buy that and I can put that in my backyard, and it contains the exact same thing. And that makes absolutely no sense to me. And so the question really has to be, why would peyote be, a, be illegal? And why would San Pedro be legal? And the answer has to be because, the, because the indigenous people of the United States aren't consuming San Pedro. That's the only answer that I can see. And if they were, then it would be illegal too. And, and it's not, and so I don't know. And so I, I, I think that the, the fear of the other, the fear of the unknown, the fear of whatever pushed people, you know, in the past to, to reject this type of, of a sacred plant and the use of the sacred plant. Um, and I don't know, it, it's, it just kind of show, it kind of reveals the, the fraught nature and the hypocrisy of, of, of the laws of this country that, that unfortunately aren't always perfect. Um, I've heard Catholics renamed it to San Pedro. Yeah, and so the indigenous name of this plant is Wachuma. And um, it's, I don't know if it's the Catholics that renamed it San Pedro. It's probably more of Hispanicized indigenous people or possibly Mestizo people, because the idea here is that San Pedro, St. Peter, held the keys to heaven. He's the one that lets you get into heaven. And guess what? This plant also has the keys to let you access the spirit world. Now, I don't know how true that is, but that's what I've, I've heard um, said about the name of uh, San Pedro. Um, uh, real important here, and I know less about uh, San Pedro than I do peyote. And so I, like I said, I don't have a whole lot to say here, but what definitely we have to say is that there is a, there was a culture, I think it's about a thousand years ago, maybe, maybe 1500 years ago. That's a, a place called Chabin de Huantar. And this is in Peru, I believe, close to the ocean, I think. And it was, excuse me, it was the site it was, it seems to be the site of a San Pedro or Wachuma cult. There's some kind of uh, ritual, uh, kind of religious building. It doesn't look like there were, it was a settlement. It wasn't a population living there. It was kind of a religious, uh, a, a religious destination, if you will. Kind of like a, um, kind of like a, um, like a temple, if you will. And, uh, and at this location, at this site, there are, um, there are carvings, like you can see here, this carving, uh, the carvings of the San Pedro cactus. So we've got it in his hand here. It's some kind of, um, it looks like a man, but I think he's got like, a, he's got like a claws on his feet and he's got a, a few other animalistic features on him. And I, so it's probably, I think he's got some serpents up there. And usually when you see these um, kind of, uh, uh, humanoid forms that are mixed with the animal features. It's usually a reference to some kind of shamanism. And the, for the Aztec, it would be Nagualism. And so this idea of being able to change from a human into some kind of uh, animal um, spirit or form. And so um, it's probably a shamanic figure there. He's holding the columnar cactus of the San Pedro, the Wachuma. And it looks like there were probably some kind of like, there was like a labyrinth set up inside this temple and initiates would go inside, would consume this uh, sacred um, sacrament and then would make their way through the, uh, the labyrinth of the temple, uh, which sounds a lot to me like the Eleusinian mysteries in Greece where they were drinking the kaikion and having a similar type of experience where they're in an enclosed space and they're having kind of like a rebirth experience. Um, and that's actually all I'm going to be saying about the San Pedro in, 
uh, for now. Um, so um, I will open it up. If you guys have any uh, last uh, comments or questions, I, I would love to hear them. And I'm sure that other people would love to hear them as well. Yeah, good. thank you very much. Um, th this this class of substance of plant is, as you're pointing out, Athena, um, rightly so, is almost anti-addictive. It's often such a difficult experience. Uh, it can be positive. I don't, I, I don't mean difficult and then bad. I mean difficult and positive. Um, it can be difficult and positive, but it's almost never a get hooked on it and let's do it again. It's not like it's it's a different type of thing. And often there's a little bit of hesitance. Uh, I don't I don't know if I want to do this. This is this is a serious, serious thing. And and I think that um, uh, especially when you kind of understand the power of these of these plants and, and you and you go to them with the kind of humility and respect, then you're not going to want to abuse it. And as you point out, it, it has a lot of, we're just kind of learning what, they're, what they can do for individuals that have problems, mental problems, uh, treatment resistant depression, PTSD, addictions of all sorts. And a lot of these substances under the right conditions with a little bit of counseling and a little bit of therapy are, in, are miracle workers. They, they, they're, they're incredible. The, the percentage of people that quit smoking doing this is it's higher than any other treatment. It's really incredible. And so and we'll talk about some of this, especially when we get to magic mushrooms with the, with the treatment resistant uh, uh, depression and, and PTSD and end of life um, um, anxiety and things like that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but, 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 you know, the, the, the kind of the trope from the 60s that, oh, it'll make you crazy and it's addictive and you'll, it'll, it'll ruin your DNA. It's, it's has, has been revealed to be just that. It's just, it's just a trope. It was just a story. It was just a story that we were told for lots of different reasons, unfortunately. Um, thankfully, we're getting to the point in our society where we're starting to challenge those old ideas and we're starting to set the record straight, which is fantastic because um, uh, we're, we're finally starting to realize what these indigenous communities have known for thousands of years is that if they're used right, if you go to them with good intents and intentions, then, then you can do some pretty incredible things. And I don't even think we understand the limit of what is possible, you know? Yeah. It's shocking. It's shocking that they would make it illegal for people to study. It's. They listen to science. Yes, yes. But it's, it's almost always a political, it's a political decision and not a scientific decision or a religious spiritual decision. I would be fine with either the science or the religion, but when it's political, it, it, it usually ends up bad. Um, let's go real quick to uh, the chat. It looks like, let me see if I can put a 
it up here. Um, associated questions related to hesitancy for using these substances are probably, will I lose my mind? Will this change me forever? Will I like this change? At least to my knowledge, we've got some hands up real quick. Can you, can you, can, can you guys come over here or something? Because I don't think you're loud enough and my mic isn't good enough to, um, to get you. That was one of the things that I was going to talk about because I wanted to talk a little bit about my personal experience with peyote. Um, because I am a shaman, I went through my practices through the um, Cherokee side of it. Um, to answer your questions, no, you will not lose your mind. It does open you to perspective. Um, if you come into it with that kind of mindset, you might get a little anxiety going through it and you, you could set it off in towards a negative aspect. But if you come into it knowing that you're expanding your consciousness, knowing that you want to find answers, not only for your spiritual self, but also for the world around you that we live in. Oh, the experience is absolutely beautiful. Um, yes, it can change you forever. It did for me. It made me accept things that happened to me in my childhood. It made me accept myself. It also gave me an ego death, which is, I don't, sit in my ego as much as you would see a majority of people around here they sit in their narcissistic traits and those things can really set you in a whole different direction um and majority of the time yeah you'll like this change there is no record of it ever giving long-term psychological effects mm -hmm. the last thing the long it lasts in your body is 12 hours yes um and yes it can alter you in a way that you'll be changed forever but it's not going to keep you in psychosis for yeah. a, for a long period of time it's more of it's a spiritual and more of a personal long term longevity instead of the actual effects of it uh, let me add one thing real quick is, is uh, we've got all these names for all of these different things. And the one that we've been hitting real hard today was psychedelic um, because of the history with Aldous Huxley and Humphrey Osmond. Um, but these substances were, have also been called in the past psychotomimetic. That's to say they mirror the manifestations of psychosis. And that's one of the reasons they've been so interesting for um, in psychiatry, et cetera. And so um, uh, talking about a long-term physical kind of um, dependency or effects, et cetera, um, uh, usually very, very, very low. If, if there is kind of a history of certain conditions, you might want to think long and hard about how, how you approach these substances uh, uh, because uh, there, there, there might be a, a, a tendency for someone that's, that's not very well grounded in reality, you know, it, to, if you get a little bit of a push, you know, and so it, it's something to, that you need to, uh, to con you need to consult with um, a, a professional, someone, a practitioner, someone that uh, understands this, a uh, 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 psychiatric, um, uh, professional, etc. Uh, let's see, going back to the chat here, it says, Veronica says, so it sounds like the popularization of synthetic and manufactured substances came about with the stigmatization of indigenous practices and the colonized idea of we know better or science has all the answers. I think there's a certain, to a certain extent that there's a little bit of that in there for sure. I think definitely, yeah. And we often will, you know, science kind of reduces it to the common denominator. Let's pull it, it's mescaline, there we go. We're gonna use that. And, and we kind of forget that sometimes there are lots of other things in the plant that might be contributing to the experience as well. And so this idea that we, that we always kind of go the synthetic route or we go the scientific route or we go the pharmaceutical route is um, it can be very problematic, right? It's expensive, it's costly, it, 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 it have lots of different things. And so um, uh, the kind of the natural route is often uh, a, a very good way to go. Makes you wonder why they make it illegal. Yeah, I know. All right. Is it okay if I add something? My hand is up. Uh, yes, Mary, let's see. I think we're, oh, shoot. Yeah, Mary, if you have something, please. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good. Great. I just wanted to add something that I put in the chat earlier uh, as we're talking about the ghost dance. And, you know, um, I want to make sure that we also uh, lift up and center that many uh, Native folks across the continent 
uh, paid with their lives for the protection of these medicines, these plants, and these ceremonies. Um, the culmination of what they believe is the ghost dance movement uh, was the massacre at Wounded Knee, where, where many of the Plains Indians, especially the leadership, uh, were killed um, you know, in defense of, of the ghost dance. And um, I myself uh, sit on um, Native Council here in the San Bernardino and the Riverside area. And we often talk about, uh, you know, some of these issues in a way uh, where the Native folks have asked that um, folks show a lot of restraint and patience when learning about these ceremonies and these medicines. Because people paid with their lives and literally had to hide many of these practices, um, under penalty of prison or death. Um, it is something that's very delicate for, for Native people and, and something that requires, you know, an, a, an, a certain amount of attention to the sacredness of it, you know. Um, and so I just want to say that because I feel like as we talk about, you know, whether a substance is addictive or not, or whether a uh, uh, how how we can use uh, some of these medicines in new ways, or 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 uh, you know use them in um, younger ages. There were many uh, you know uh, folks who had to wait decades in order to get to a point that they were ready to use uh, medicines. At a certain point, there was a very slow, respectful. Uh, learning process that went along with the use of these medicines and ceremonies and um, sometimes we're quick to implement them without having the full knowledge of how to use them appropriately. So the Native folks in our region have asked that uh, those of us who are allies that we lift up that message and remind folks that uh, there are people who paid with their lives uh, to protect these ceremonies and these medicines and that they should be treated accordingly, you know. Definitely, thank you very much for that. And yeah, I would also out of respect add, for those folks. And just, just one more thing I wanted to yeah, add. Go ahead. Also, they have, they've asked that um, we be cautious about the use of the word shaman or medicine people, um, because there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, of, of those terms sometimes. And um, they just wanna uh, caution folks from using that language. And, um, and to maybe uh, just work on trying to find other ways that folks might identify themselves while they're learning, um, because those uh, there's a lot of um, like con, con men and people that kind of adopt that language that has really put a lot of stigma on, on indigenous practices and indigenous medicine and indigenous ceremonies. So I just wanna deliver those two message from your local native council. And thank you so much, Micah, for hosting this. We have a lot of folks that are interested in attending these in the future, and I hope we can uh, keep seeing these grow and grow with more and more audience. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mary. We appreciate uh, those words. We appreciate the message. Um, that is also why I say I'm pagan versus saying I'm a shaman. When I say I'm a shaman, I'm talking about more of like shaman, shaman spirituality. Um, shaman is Yeah, that's good. Uh, with, with these terms, Mary brings up a very good point here is, is that um, it's almost like these terms always end up being a little bit problematic in one context or another. That's why they're there, you know, even just if you just take the Western perspective, there's, I don't know, three, four, five, six, seven different ways to view this. Psychomimetic, entheogen, psychedelic, plant spirit medicines. I mean, and, and so terminology, I think what Mary's pointing out here and um, what Athena is, is, uh, is also confirming, I think, is, is that terminology is problematic. It's problematic for us on a daily basis in regular life, and it's, E equally problematic or more problematic when you talk about these extremely powerful substances and plants. Uh, the term shaman itself, I mean, comes from Siberia and probably shouldn't be used outside of that specific context. 
But nonetheless, we find, we use it and, and, and you know, we, we have certain tools in our toolbox and, and we try to use them and sometimes we grab the wrong tool and sometimes it's the right tool. And, and, and you know, that's why we're, we're all trying to move forward and we're trying to figure out uh, the best way to understand these things. And if anyone says they understand something as uh, difficult to understand is the psychedelic experience. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if, if you should believe them because it, it's, it's something that is so unique and personal and so different and so subjective and ultimately so ineffable and so hard to understand and so hard to convey that, uh, that, that I, I think we, we, we all need to have a healthy dose of, of, of humility and and uh, understanding and, uh, and um, yeah, to move forward, I think. I don't know, any other comments or questions? The language is always going to be a marker of cultural shifts. Some words become loaded over time and it could be very hard to de-integrate uh, some ideas from these words. That's true, 100%, Kadir, I agree. Those are the effects of colonization and decolonization and just the problems with language and the problems with metaphor and the problems of representation. And I would say, uh, if, if you don't think that representation is difficult, then I will, I'll circle all the way back to Salvador Dali and I will point you to his painting, Crucifixion, Corpus Hypercubus, where my understanding is he's making a comment on the difficult, uh, the difficulty of representing something. Because a word is never the thing that we're trying to make it be. It's just some sounds. And sometimes it's, it's one thing in someone's mind and sometimes it's another thing in someone else's mind. And, and, and it's just, uh, it's one of the flaws of the beautiful thing that we call language, which is in my opinion, nothing short of a miracle, nothing short of magic. It's language is so incredible that it, it's kind of uh, disheartening to see when language lets us down. And sometimes it does. Yeah, go ahead. I'm trying to remember which substance it was in the, again, in the Western scientific approach to these, these substances, I think it was MDMA. I think they originally wanted to call MDMA telepathy because I think I, I would, you'd have to double check that, but before they wanted to call it, uh, let's see, MDMA is, uh, it's something, something amphetamine. Any, anyone, anyone know about the M MDMA at any rate? I think you're right. Yes. Yes. It was, it was, uh, so it would be dimethyltryptamine. So it was probably dimethyltryptamine that they originally wanted to call telepathy because people were having people that were at one event were having a similar experience, seeing things, feeling things, communicating with people without speaking. And so, I, I mean, when you get stubborn Western scientists to start to want to call something telepathy because they think that there's, there's some telepathy there. That, that's a sign of probably something more than actually what's there, I would think, but a very good, um, a very good contribution. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry guys on, on, online. It's um, I, I misspoke. I don't think it's MDMA. I think it's actually the dimethyltryptamine in the, in the ayahuasca used with the harmine and the harmaline uh, of um of the Banisteriopsis capi. No, uh, no. Do you want to say something? I think we're, I think we're getting close to ending. I think, I think Athena, I think the president wants to make a quick announcement. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you come on over here? Um, uh, let's see what we can do here. And then I'll have you walk in because uh, I need to send, put the link onto the Zoom. Um, so that everybody can just click the link there. Let's and they'll immediately see be invited what in. This is. So, what, Discord? Yeah, Discord. So, my announcement right here. is we have a Discord page where um, you guys can come on and we'll be able to talk all the time. It's going to have uh, the BB. The, 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 
if I can speak, the Biblioteca, which is going to have all the information on the Camecas. It's going to have different articles. It's going to have different things on all the plants that we go over. Um, I already posted one thing up, and that is the article I was reading earlier about the peyote. Um, so on Discord, uh, go ahead and log in if you can. I don't know if I oh, can. Uh, open Discord in your browser. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can. We'll see. Yeah, it should allow you. There you go. Oh, you already locked in. Okay, go to here. Here. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and send the link into Zoom. You guys can immediately join, um, but everyone here in the room, it'll be a little bit different. Put it right there. Yeah, beautiful. I'll do it. Uh, and then go ahead and post oh, This it. has to be everyone. There we go. You want to tell them what that is? So that link that was just posted in, that is the Discord that I'll send you straight into the Discord. Um, it'll add you right in and um, you can put comments, you can talk. I have general areas where it's just general conversation where everyone can talk. Um, there is a gaming section. There's all kinds of different things. So if you guys do have Discord, uh, come meet me at my computer and I'll go ahead and invite you guys in one by one because it's the only process at this point <laughs> um, through Zoom. It's a little bit easier because I can just post the link and everybody can just join in. So yeah, um, but this Discord is for everybody that is in the club. You can sit here, chit chat, talk, learn more. Um, more articles will be going up into the Biblioteca throughout time. Um, this is a place where we can come together as a community. So yeah. Great, and I'll just comment on Mary's last comment there. Thank you, Mary, for bringing that up. Uh, the, the kind of the casual use of medicines, different communities that have been demonized, stigmatized for uh, for their use of certain plants. Um, I agree. I, I think that all plants should be legalized. And so uh, I don't agree with the criminalization of any of that. And I think that uh, people need to have, I think if people had a, a, a healthier respect for the power of these plants, we'd have fewer problems in the world. Um, let's see, thank you. I think, um, I think that's probably it guys. Any last, uh, any last comments or questions or, or anything else? I, I appreciate you being here with us. Um, I went a little bit longer than I expected, but I think it was well worth it. I think we had a good conversation. We had some good questions and some good comments. Thank you very much. I hope to see you guys um, next time. It will be October 21st. We're going to be talking about Belladonna, Henbane, Mandrake, uh, Mandrake Paturi. That's a Tropa Belladonna, Hyosiamus niger, Mandragora officinarum, and Deboisia hapwoodi. Uh, That's Deadly Nightshade, Stinking Nightshade, Mandrake, Emu Bush, Hyosiamine, Scopolamine, Atropine, Nicotine, and essentially the witch's brew of Europe. Um, and then I'll leave you with this. This is my little... Tree Datura here, guys. All right, thank you for joining us. And I'll see you guys next time. Cool.